Let me begin by saying that what we want to do is to step away from talking about uh, the platinum prices, what's driving it, et cetera, et cetera, and ask a relevant question. If the world has OPEC for oil producers, why can't Southern Africa and the platinum producing countries have an, an OPEC equivalent organization? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I think if you go back to when OPEC was formed, I mean, you, you, you see it was the Arab nations who uh, sort of like nationalized their assets effectively and working through their countries to uh, negotiate prices effectively. You've still got the private oil producers, the ExxonMobil's, the Chevron's, etc., and they operate outside of those regions, outside of OPEC and outside of Venezuela, etc. The market is determined on, on exchanges around the world. Right. OPEC only has the ability to reduce production or to increase production, right. and they do that strategically when they feel that the market is at a certain level. So there's no reason why the platinum producers couldn't get together other than, say, competition commission issues, etc. But if we reduced it to a national level, let's put it this way, let's say South Africa getting together with Zimbabwe and we know they pretty much account for what uh, production there is in the world of platinum uh, so output. Four fifths, yeah. Exactly. Uh, add or subtract a few other little small producers. If Zimbabwe and South Africa go together and say, tell you what, we actually can control this market, could they? It's, it's difficult. I mean, the, Why not? the commodity cycle moves in cycles literally because when prices are weak, producers buy out smaller, weaker producers, higher cost producers, and yes, right. they are able to be more um, disciplined right. in, in their production and, and to hold back production. Prices then rise and buyers flood into the market and prices top out, and then the market becomes oversupplied as people rush into the market. With platinum, it is, it is quite specific. Yes, it's, it's a very high cost industry, very difficult to mine, mm -hmm. very high entry for anyone to get into the market. So the entrenched miners, yes, have a lot of pricing power, but they have yeah. to be very careful how they they use that power. Sure. They don't want to drive away their buyers, um, sure. which are also a very specialized you know, type of buyers, etc. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of industrial uses for buyers, and there probably is quite a diverse base of buyers that will always be in the market. Yeah. Um, but you have to be careful. It's, it's Could the governments of Zimbabwe and South Africa say, and I'm not suggesting that um, that's what they should do, but I'm saying, could they theoretically come to the producers, in other words, the companies that are operating on the ground, and say to them, guys, Per annum, for the next X years, you are going to produce X amount of platinum and then be flexible enough to adjust it should the need arise, should they see, for instance, for instance pricing getting too high to a, to, to, to a point where it makes it profitable for other things. I, to I think it's difficult it. to, um, to introduce caps or, or, or limits that the producers have to produce to. You want them to be free to operate in the market in a free market fashion and, and sure. control their costs. Obviously, they're trying to control their costs. That's their biggest issue, control uh, labor costs. Obviously, there's geological issues. It's deep mining. Yeah. I mean, you're literally mining about a meter, sort of two or three kilometers underground. Um, what possibly is possible, and you're seeing this in countries around the world, Australia, Indonesia, which have restricted low-grade coal exports, for instance. All right. You can introduce perhaps a permit system where um, every ton of platinum, another strategic mineral like chrome, for instance, every ton of chrome or every ton of coal below a certain quality that leaves the country yeah. has to have an export permit associated with it. In that way, you automatically increase the price, but it's the, it's, it then becomes almost like government revenues, which, which could be distributed to the, to the workforce or, yeah. or, or, or to development in those areas. Yeah. When you, when, you, when you deconstruct the platinum price right now as it stands, what would you say would be the major drivers if we take out the issues around production issues here in South Africa, we sure. also take out perhaps uh, some of the uh, problems that we've seen emanating out of Zimbabwe? Well, the price has obviously reached a level where it rises and falls in line with domestic uh, industrial demand. So, you know, if you consider all the, the normal industrial uses, order catalytic converters, they're used in hard drives, they're used in medical technology, yeah. um, fuel cells, etc. Then there's the jewelry side. Um, th there's there's a, a hell of a lot of demand for platinum from various sources, and that's industrial demand, which rises and falls in line with the rest of the commodity complex, oil prices or, or, or growth in the in, in the developed world, etc. Yeah. Uh, coming into January, we, we, we rallied about $100 in a very short period of time, and that was principally because of the worries around Eskom um, power. Right. So that is a large driver in the market. You must understand that the platinum price is derived from traders sitting in London who are either sitting in a bank or yeah. they're sitting in a, in, a, in a metals trading house, et cetera, and they are operating on behalf of buyers or producers ar around the world, and they are really determining the, the, the price. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, any, anything they hear from supply issues outside of South Africa or yeah. 
possibly electricity supply concerns, and the cost of that electricity is going to have a big impact on the platinum price. How much would you say there is in the current platinum price, the political risk inherent in South Africa on two fronts? One, nationalization, you know, nationalizing the mines, in other words, uh, going the route of the, uh, of the ANC Youth League recommendations, and secondly, just in terms of uh, South Africa as a place to operate business, given all the issues of the economic in, policy. Yeah, I, I, I don't think traders in London are concerned that much about They're not worried. They're not worried. They, they look at the, the macro effects, and it's, it's a lot of buy the rumor, sell the fact type of thing. So if right. there's a rumor of an electricity okay. cut, the price rallies, and then it falls back down. Yeah. It, it moves on long-term supply and demand issues. Sure. Bizarrely, if you were to nationalize the mines, the price would go up because obviously yeah. everyone expects that production would just simply fall and, yeah. and you wouldn't have an efficient platinum producer anymore. Sure. Therefore, the price goes through the roof. Yeah. However, the nationalized mines wouldn't be able to benefit from that because they wouldn't be able to get to the produce production out case. of the country. Right. Yeah. Okay. What about Zimbabwe? How much of it is in that price? Zimbabwe is seen as an add-on. I mean, South Africa is obviously the, 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 the key driver, the main producer. Yeah. And obviously, I mean, as you mentioned earlier, Zimplats, et cetera, you know, um, and, and Impala Platinum get a lot of their exposure to Zimbabwe. That is concerning because it's, it's that marginal ton in the platinum price which right. drives prices higher or lower. And if Zimbabwe, if the marginal ton were to fall off and Zimbabwe, again, if something were to happen there and those tons weren't available anymore, then yes, that marginal ton would cause the price to rise or fall. And if Zimbabwe were to normalize and suddenly get a country where business can operate normally and suddenly we're able to see production being rammed up, Coming how much through. would come out of it? Yeah, it's, 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 diff it's really difficult to say, but I mean, <laughs> you, you, you have to look at how the price has moved. You know, there's volatility in the, in the platinum price and it's sure. probably about 25%. I mean, metals volatility, oil volatility is always higher than equities volatility. Yeah. Um, so you can expect certain orderly price movements per day. Um, if you saw an absolute collapse or nationalization overnight of the industry, you could expect $200, $300 move in one day. Right. But I mean, you wouldn't expect more than sort of five, ten dollars in in a day. So and, where and there's to also the, the gold ratio. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Would, that. that was exactly yeah. my next point. Where to now for the platinum price? We've seen that now, that that, 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 that uh, difference narrowing uh, pretty much in the in the last few months or so. Yeah, I think you know. Uh, uh, it's a certain type of trader who will do the gold platinum spread. He, yeah. You know, he's maybe got um, exposure on both sides. I think you know we, we've realized now that in, inflation is, has been kept at bay, but it could come down the line. And as and when inflation does come, gold will rally, and platinum will rally in line with gold. So platinum will benefit from higher inflation. But just fundamentally, on a, on a supply demand basis, I think platinum has to outperform gold on the fundamentals. You believe in gold, Bevan Jones, General Manager, London Commodity Brokers. Thank you for your time.